welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. You know, when it comes to supplements, I am a huge nerd. In fact, I use dozens, more than dozens of supplements every single day. And they have a major impact on the way I look and feel. But the truth is, it wasn't always that way. I used to joke that supplements only made for expensive urine. I truly believed that about 20 years ago, like most physicians. And while I've changed my opinion on that, it's true that not all supplements are created equal. Unfortunately, many of the supplements you'll find on store shelves are, number one, totally useless and can actually be dangerous for your health, which is why high-quality supplements are so important. They can have a dramatic effect on your health and longevity and are well worth the time and money, in my opinion. But how do you decipher between a pure, clean supplement that will do what it says on the label and one that's completely bogus? Well, my guest today is here to help. He's Dr. Hector Lopez, a physician scientist with a uniquely diverse background in sports medicine, exercise science, nutritional biochemistry, and clinical research. Dr. Lopez co-owns and directs an integrated triad of B2B companies within the dietary, supplement, functional foods, and medical food spaces. Today, he and I will reveal the shocking truth about many of the supplements on the market, share some insider tips for choosing the highest quality supplements, and discuss the amazing new compound discovered by Dr. Lopez himself that can help you boost your energy and help you lead a longer, happier life. Hector, it's so great to have you on the show, and nice to meet you in person. Likewise. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Gundry. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Now, many listeners know that over 20 years ago, I resigned my post at Loma Linda to start my own clinics focused on nutrition and lifestyle changes. And I've seen firsthand how diet changes and supplements could improve health in a way that Western medicine simply cannot. So let's talk about your triad of B2B companies. What are they and what do they do? Yeah, so, um, so essentially I, I probably uh, went through a, a similar experience in that I, I transitioned away from clinical medicine into the industry full time. I had been consulting previously, um, always sort of had one foot in the uh, dietary supplement space, if you will, or functional food space. Um, one of my companies is based on regulatory compliance. So uh, Supplement Safety Solutions, we um, brought a program to the industry that we called NutriVigilance. We coined that term. Um, and you're probably familiar, of course, with pharmacovigilance in the pharmaceutical world. And so we, uh, we saw a, a, a huge need in the space, in the dietary supplement space, to be able to bring in a group like, such as ours, which is also physician-based who also understands the dietary supplement space, uh, understands how ingredients work, many of the mechanisms generally, uh, and also understands the regulation, the FDA regulation uh, specifically related to um, how to cover post-market safety surveillance. Basically, that means anyone who brings a product to market is supposed to have a system in place to be able to monitor and surveil if there are ever any sort of... Um, uh, health-related complaints, if there are any safety signals, what we call. And so that's essentially what Supplement Safety Solutions does. Uh, the other company is called Center for Applied Health Sciences, or CAHS, and that's an Ohio-based research institute. Uh, my partners and I there basically run human clinical trials, uh, mostly focused on the dietary supplement space. So, of course, you know, throughout all of medical education, medical training, you're on you're often on the wards and you hear, oh, there's no evidence to support that or, oh, there's no evidence supporting dietary supplements. And, well, I'm here to say that there, there certainly has been for a long time. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes uh, when when you're a, a resident or a medical student and the attending says there's no evidence, it's unfortunately sometimes because there's no evidence they're aware of. Uh, but there's often uh, quite, a, quite a robust amount of evidence. Um, and, and so we've actually run at CHS over 150 human clinical trials over the last 10 years. 
And all of them focused on either a dietary ingredient or a combination of multi-ingredients, multiple ingredients in a multi-ingredient finished product, looking at the safety and the efficacy to substantiate claims. Um, and then finally, the third sort of, um, uh, I guess, leg to the three-legged stool, as we say, the triad, is um, a company uh, that mostly holds intellectual property discoveries or discovering novel ingredients and trying to commercialize uh, that intellectual property, uh, but it's all uh, evidence-based. So we do the discovery, the development, the incubation, and then the validation and substantiation, ultimately uh, going all the way from in vitro preclinical studies all the way to human clinical studies. So almost think of it as a mini pharma model, but focused on just leveraging uh, the wonderful treasure trove that nature has afforded us and trying to bring ingredients and new products to market that are safe and effective to optimize health and human performance and, of course, longevity as well. So, so what, are, what are some of the biggest problems uh, for so many of the supplements on the market today? I mean, why can't I just throw something in a capsule and say it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, which, by the way, folks, is not good for you. Uh, but, <laughs> Why I can I could do that right? Yeah, so I, I think look what one of the issues with the dietary supplement space. Of course, it's often maligned by the media and even in, individuals in our profession, obviously in the medical establishment. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, there's a very low barrier to entry, right, to get into the dietary supplement space. I mean, essentially. All you need to do is if you've got the capital and you've got the funding, you can go to a contract manufacturer of which there are hundreds, of course, in North America alone. Uh, and you could just let them know, hey, I want to be able to bring a, a product to market, a, a weight loss product to market, for example. And um, these individuals may not have any training, any background at all in nutritional biochemistry, let alone uh, even health and, and nutrition or or medicine, um, or anything related to the dietary supplement space. And so they can just jump in, dive in, have a label, a product on the market with very little barrier to entry. Uh, of course, there's no approval process per se. Um, and that, that sets up a scenario where you can have bad actors who come into that space and bring a product to market that may have dubious health uh, benefits, if any, and could actually be harmful. Uh, so if they don't understand ingredients, dosing, uh, sourcing, which is huge, and adulteration, which could also be a problem, uh, then you, you could sort of see where there's a setup for bad scenarios to occur. So is there, I mean, is there any way the, the consumer is sitting, is standing in a shelf in a health food store or looking at Amazon and there's, uh, we, we won't name something, but how, how <laughs> without do Without naming names. Yeah, without naming names. Sure. Actually, I, I got to tell this story. Um, <laughs> long ago, actually, after my first book came out, um, there were several supplement companies approached me for putting my name on some of their supplements. And uh, again, we won't name names, but one of these <laughs> companies was in New Jersey, where you are located. And uh, uh -huh. uh, it was not you. Uh, but <laughs> I, was, I was watching these uh, supplements come down uh, a conveyor belt. And they would be divided into two lines. And different labels uh, with actually doctors' names were put on each one. And one doctor, quite frankly, got about, oh, four times the amount for the same supplement that the <laughs> other doctor wasn't very famous, but they were the exact same supplement. And the, the point of all this was that neither of these doctors had actually designed these supplements. They were merely putting their names on it, and the cachet of one doctor was apparently made his supplement much more expensive than the other supplement, which was identical. Right. And yeah. until I actually founded Gundry MD, I refused you know, to put my name on this sort of thing. I, 
I wanted control over the ingredients based on my 20 years of experimenting with myself and patients and allowing them sure. to, yeah. So that happens all the time, right? It absolutely does. Yeah, the, the, the wonderful world of white labeling or private labeling, right, as we call it in the industry. Right. And, and you're right. The, the issue with that is it could be, it could very well be a, a wonderful formula. It could be a great formula. It could be good to have validated, branded, patented ingredients with safety and efficacy. But again, you lose touch of, you, you lose that accountability if the individual whose name's on the, obviously on the label has no real input on the design of the formula and doesn't really understand their product. And, and that's, that, that's, that, leaves, that leaves that brand open to um, a lot of potential pitfalls there. And, and, and that is just one example of some of the nefarious things that can happen in the industry. But by and large, I think the majority of players in the space are trying to do the right thing and their heart's in the right place. Uh, of course, there's the old adage, right? The the the, the road to uh, um, uh, the road to hell oh. is paved in good intent, right? With good intentions. But and, and um, you and you know my corollary to that: the road to health is paved with good intestines. Ah, I like that. I like that. that that's the first I hear that, but that, I like that. That's great. That's great. So so um, so yeah. Ultimately, it's it, it becomes a challenge for a consumer to, I guess, make a decision and understand which products on the market are reliable and have a, a strong scientific substantiation behind them or have a strong quality assurance, quality control team behind them, um, uh, or, or an individual such as yourself, a professional um, who's representing the brand and designing the, the products behind the brand. So that's, uh, that, that's key. There are some, uh, I would say there are some opportunities to look for uh, certain seals on the label um, that you also need to be careful there as well because some seals can just be you know you can make up a seal and have it on the label of course uh, but others are important we actually for example at our regulatory compliance company developed a seal called Nutri Vigilance Verified and so that lets you know that at least someone is watching the cookie jar who's a third party not an owner in the company but of course a physician directed third party who's looking out for pre and post market safety. Uh, you could also look for other seals uh, that are involved with third party testing as well, independent testing to make sure that um, what's on the label is actually what's in the bottle. Yeah, and you know, we, all of our Gundry MD products, uh, you know, our third party tested goes, again, um, don't take my word for it. Uh, we want somebody else to verify that that's in there. So, that's right. so that's something that a consumer should look at when they're, you know, picking up a jar in a health food store. Are there any, are there any dead giveaways that uh, you might not be getting what you think you're getting in that product? Well, there is this practice to look for. It's the practice of um, proprietary blends. Uh, that tends to happen. Now, here's the thing with proprietary blends. If the intention of the proprietary blend is not to fairy dust or sprinkle in small doses of, of well-reputed, um, um, I guess, premium ingredients, then there would be nothing wrong with proprietary uh, blending if that's really what it's doing, is protecting someone's intellectual property. However, um, that creates an opportunity for someone to do it for the wrong reasons. So they may, uh, they may have an, an ingredient proprietary blend that has four ingredients and two or three or four of the ingredients are uh, very low cost, uh, very low quality. Uh, and, and maybe there's one ingredient that's, uh, that's a, a price, a cost driver. So they can prop blend it in order to reduce the overall cost of their product and increase their margins, still selling the product at a, a standard retail price. Um, so that's definitely something to look for. Um, it, it's, it doesn't mean 100% of proprietary blends are utilizing this practice. But I think by and large, there are very few reasons to have a proprietary blend these days because... Uh, for example, we have multiple ingredients on the market that we've commercialized that are ingredients that we license to the industry so the whole industry can use it, but they can use the 
trademark version, which you know is patent protected. And that's the, the ingredient that has also been through the rigors of safety testing and human clinical trials. And hence, you can make substantiation based on that branded proprietary ingredient, but it can be fully disclosed on the label. And so I think that's something to look for. I think that's a very good point. Um, I know uh, there are a lot of uh, well thought out blends, uh, well documented blends, but so many companies uh, want to catch your eye with you know, something that may have a very legitimate benefit. And the clinical studies show that you should be taking 200 milligrams of this compound twice a day to get the observed clinical benefit. And in this particular product, there's two milligrams. And right. unfortunately, most people see the name, but they don't really see how much of that is there. And you're right. Uh, it's usually a cost-saving uh, reason, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. So particularly if you see almost the exact same product that says it's the same stuff, and the one is you know a quarter of the price of the other one, usually you'll find the reason on the back if you if you bother to look. That's right. That's right. And I think another uh, telltale sign, or something else, it's a tool that your consumers can look for is understand that um, by law, uh, all ingredients have to be listed in order of weight predominance. So even if it's uh, a nutrition facts panel and not a dietary supplement that would list out the individual ingredients like a food, for example, uh, a protein product or a protein fiber macronutrient based product, they can also make sure that, um, that the order of uh, ingredients listed uh, matches what they're looking for. If they're buying a product because they want a high quality protein, then you better make sure that that protein is first or second on that list. Right? Are there any ingredients that our listeners should avoid when they're looking at all this? <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's a bit of a, a, a loaded question. Right? It because, is. Because it, it, it really depends on so many variables. Um, uh, but I think it's important for consumers to work with someone who's knowledgeable in the space and understands the dietary supplement space and can someone that consumers can trust, uh, uh, ideally a healthcare professional who also has additional training and experience and expertise, such as yourself in, in nutrition or nutritional biochemistry and uh, nutritional sciences in general. Um, uh, but, uh, you, you know, there are some designer stimulants that have made their way onto the marketplace that uh, that consumers should be aware of because of course there can be some uh substantial interactions with uh for example psychotropic medications or antidepressants or antipsychotics and um anti-anxiety medications so uh yeah there's there's some uh, designer um stimulants i would also say there are also some ingredients that are not really dietary ingredients but have made their way into dietary supplements as well they're essentially drugs that are masquerading or they're unapproved misbranded drugs that are masquerading as dietary supplements. And these are some things like SARMs or, uh, certain hormonal modulators that, that could be used sometimes in, uh, in certain circles of the dietary supplement space. Um, but they tend not to be mass market. They tend not to have as much exposure. They're sort of trying to fly under the radar as well. And they, and they may sell it at, at, um, very small retail, specialty retail centers. Hmm. Okay. Um, any ingredients that people should look for, or is that a loaded question too? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, it, it, you know, I, I often end up uh, getting asked, and I'm sure you do as well, right? What's the best supplement I should be on, right? What's it? And there really is no best for everyone, right? Because one size fits all means one size fits nobody. And there should be a, a degree of customization, if you will, to what an individual is looking for, depending on what their goals are. Uh, but I think generally some of my, I'll tell you, you know, some, some supplements that I take, for example, that are non-negotiables. So I'm definitely on a high quality uh, marine based uh, omega-3 fatty acid product. So an EPA, DHA, DPA supplement. Um, I like uh, astaxanthin. Uh, I also am on magnesium, 
uh, usually a, a magnesium that's a chelated form of magnesium, either magnesium threonate or glycine-based glycinate. Um, I also do take some products that are higher in the um, curcuminoid polyphenol um, uh, category. Uh, I also take, even though I take it for general health and wellness and longevity, I take creatine monohydrate, which I know may sound like a surprise, right? Because most people associate creatine with uh, bodybuilders or sports nutrition, uh, but there are some enormous uh, general health and wellness side benefits to creatine. So I also take creatine. Uh, and then, of course, I do take uh, NAD3, which I know we'll talk about a little later as a longevity kind of super nutrient matrix. Um, and, uh, and, and I think those are sort of the non-negotiables. And then I rotate other ingredients that I guess you could consider more specialty type into my regimen. Yeah, I'm glad you brought... Uh, vitamin D3 is a big one, I'm sorry. I was going to say, vitamin <laughs> D3. You know, there's now actually 17 separate studies correlating higher vitamin D levels with uh, lessening or avoiding COVID-19. Uh, higher, the better, and the That's lower, right. the worse outcome. 17 studies now. That's right. Um, yeah. Yeah. What do they say? Where, where, where there's smoke, there's usually fire, right? <laughs> there's a lot. There's a whole lot of smoke there. Yeah. There's a lot of smoke there. I, yeah. I'm sorry, folks. Uh, you know, get some <laughs> vitamin D in you, please. Um, Absolutely. You, you got to arm yourself against this virus. Um, yeah. And yeah. That's... Regardless, right? Regardless what other uh, strategies you're, you're using, social distancing, masking, et cetera. Uh, even vaccination, you know, whether you're pro or anti-vax, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, you're still going to respond better and your outcomes are going to be better if you're metabolically tuned up, if you will. And certainly vitamin D optimization is, is one method or one strategy. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. OK, um, you, you mentioned NAD3 and I want to I want to dive deeper into this, as, as you know, uh, one of the things that you've done and other research have done are you're always, you know, discovering uh, new amazing compounds. And one is NAD3, and I take this myself. So um, thanks to your discovery. So tell wh what is it and what does it do? Yeah, so, so NAD3 is basically... Um, the product of our team, our IP discovery team, looking at longevity and uh, looking at, at um, uh, leveraging what we know are already health promoting activities. Uh, we know they're health, health span and lifespan promoting activities, uh, many of which are very much in vogue, right? So uh, things like thermal stress, sauna, cryotherapy, cold plunging, uh, of course, exercise, and that could include both resistance training and cardiovascular conditioning and aerobic exercise, uh, you know, high, low and medium intensity exercises, uh, fasting or caloric restriction, um, the consumption of Mediterranean uh, diet or polyphenol rich foods that are not uh, inadvertently inflammatory because some of them can obviously cause issues in certain individuals. Uh, so all those behaviors, all those activities, what we set out to do is we said all those activities have not only uh, is it the behavior, but that behavior is translating into a certain molecular or biochemical signature within the body, within cells. Um, and so we said, uh, what if we could look at the pattern of what genes, for example, are being turned on or what switches are being flipped on, what switches or genes are being flipped off? in order to promote those health span and longevity benefits. Um, and so that was one thing we did is we took a look at that. The other thing that happened to us was serendipitously, one of the ingredients that, that the NAD3 is focused on, we already had brought to market about eight years ago. And we did a lot of uh, preclinical animal uh, safety work, mechanistic work, and then human clinical work, over 10 human clinical trials on an ingredient called theocrine. And, um, and one of the things that we ran into serendipitously was this is an ingredient we mostly used uh, as a nootropic uh, sort of brain health promoting ingredient, good for cognition, 
mood, focus, concentration, uh, an alkaloid like caffeine, except without any of the blood pressure uh, or hemodynamic, as we call it, blood pressure, heart rate issues that you can get with caffeine uh, for cardiovascular stimulation. And one of the things we noticed was we saw in an eight-week study, we saw a decrease in triglyceride levels and LDL levels, uh, LDL cholesterol levels in subjects who were taking 200 milligrams or 300 milligrams of this ingredient. And that was totally unexpected. We were only looking at it for safety in that cohort. And we said, something is going on here metabolically. Uh, it was a robust signal. It wasn't just, uh, you know, the p-value was really robust. So we knew something was happening. And then we started uh, digging in a little further and doing some more animal work. And we discovered that one of them was also activating a prolongevity compound or uh, enzyme in the body known as sirtuin, sirtuin-3. Um, and so we put those two pieces together, uh, the fact that we wanted to look to uh, a molecular signature of longevity, along with what we already knew about theocrine. Uh, and then finally, the, the third part to what allowed us to bring NAD3 to market was we felt there was a, a big shortfall with the current approach of being so uh, pro NAD plus uh, promoting in terms of well, you just throw more NAD precursor at the problem and you'll make more NAD plus, which I'm sure consumers and listeners have heard a lot about in the in the news when looking at anti-aging or longevity. And we thought that was sort of leaving a lot on the table in terms of what we could uncover for real longevity benefits. Oh, so let me stop you for a second, because I think a lot of consumers a lot of our listeners may have heard of NAD, NAD+. I'm going to be talking a lot about it. I talked a lot about it in the longevity paradox. I'm going to talk a lot about it in the energy paradox. But just uh, in a kind of a nutshell, what the heck is NAD+, and why should I care? Yeah, so NAD+, is one of the most uh, life-sustaining, important uh, coenzymes in the body, uh, in every cell. So it, I, I don't want to underplay or underrepresent how important it is. It's incredibly important for being able to transfer electrons uh, through most chemical reactions in the body. But most, most intriguingly, it's also a substrate or a fuel to drive this complex of enzymes known as sirtuins. And without NAD, you don't get sirtuins working the way they should. So you do need an, a good, healthy pool or status of NAD plus in order to run your life uh, and live your life to the maximum, right? So anything from energy to metabolism to immune function, you name it, uh, health and human performance, you do need NAD plus. And it's actually derived from uh, vitamin B3, essentially. Uh, but the body can make it from amino acids itself. Uh, and we, of course, consume precursors to NAD plus in the form of vitamin B um, precursors or equivalents, niacin equivalents, which is vitamin B3. So that's my, I guess, nutshell explanation for NAD plus. Yeah, you, I mean, you literally have to have it to have the mitochondrial energy tra electron transport chain work. Um, right. It's that important. If you want ATP, you got to have it. Okay, Absolutely. so I don't want to yeah, interrupt you'd be, you. You'd be dead in seconds without it, right? That's now. exactly right. <laughs> you, you wouldn't <laughs> be here without it. Right. Okay, so, all right, so continue the story. Um, yeah, so, so, then, uh, so then basically we, uh, we started exploring and um, screening a library of uh, dozens of different compounds that we thought could be uh, could be important to amplify the effects of theocrine that we already had and we knew. And, um, and so we stumbled into the ingredient that the matrix of three ingredients that make up NAD3, which really are the ones that turned on uh, a, 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 an enormous number of signals that all were sort of checking the boxes for longevity benefits, for helping cellular uh, for helping with cellular resilience and, and, and improving your ability to handle environmental stressors as well as metabolic stressors uh, endogenously. So um, we started looking at, um, at gene expression models in, in vitro, meaning in cells. Uh, 
Um, and we started looking to see the effects of exposing these cells to the, the NAD3 matrix in various iterations until we landed on the one that was optimal and ideal. And that meant the right ratio of the ingredients as well as um, the right combination of ingredients. Uh, we then translated that into um, uh, human work as well. And the nice thing about NAD3 is that the three uh, ingredients that make it up, the constituents of it, which is theocrine, uh, the second ingredient, the super nutrient, is a wasabi japonica uh, extract. And um, a wasabi japonica uh, is part of the family of the brassica sort of cruciferous vegetable family. But it's even more potent in the concentration of these really powerful compounds that are known as isothiocyanates. It's one of the reasons that broccoli and broccoli sprouts, for example, with sulforaphane and uh, glucoraphanin and glucosinolates have received a lot of attention and praise recently as well for longevity benefits. Uh, but wasabi, we felt, was one of those under-recognized, underutilized uh, botanicals. And sure enough, it lit up when combined with theocrine. And our third ingredient ended up being copper-1 uh, cuprous uh, niacinamate or nicotinate. Basically, it's a stabilized form of copper. Copper can exist in two different chemical forms uh, based on the, uh, the charge or the oxidation state. It can exist as copper-1. It can exist as copper two. And uh, your listeners might be able to identify when something patinas, when you have the copper and it patinas, it turns, it goes from the you know, brilliant copper color to sort of that greenish uh, aquamarine, aqua blue, blue green color. And that means it's been oxidized to copper two state. The body uses copper in its plus one state uh, in all of the enzymatic reactions. So um, this combination is what makes up NAD3, and um, it synergistically increased many different important um, genes that we know are associated with all those activities we mentioned before that increase health span. You, you said, well, you know, we kind of stumbled on this, and uh, obviously with what you do, you don't stumble on things. There right, is serendipity, right. as you know, and as, and as I know in research, yeah. and oftentimes you're, you're looking for something to do something, and oh my gosh, it did this instead, and uh, so anyhow. Yeah, yep, the wonderful world discovery, yeah. Yeah, sure. so you didn't just stumble on this, let's... Uh, no, there, there, was, there was definitely a strong thesis behind it, and, uh, and what happened is, is uh, to your point, we serendipitously uh, and systematically uh, landed and arrived at the optimal combination with NAD3. So, uh, so what studies now have been done, you know, looking at NAD3? Uh, how, how do you know it works? Yeah, so a, a couple of different lines of, um, uh, of why it works. Uh, so first of all, uh, let's take a, there was a study that we were involved in that we um, uh, were co-authors and published with uh, a group of colleagues of ours at Auburn University. Uh, Donald Lamb was the, um, the lead author. And basically what we did is we looked at the effect of strength training, middle-aged individuals who were average age 60 years old, uh, took about 16 of those subjects, strength trained them for 10 weeks using whole body resistance training just twice a week, and we, we did is they uh, took uh, muscle biopsies from the leg, from the vastus lateralis, uh, the quadriceps muscle, and basically looked to compare it to a cohort, a comparator of young 22-year-olds, on average there were 16, 22-year-olds that were already recreationally weight training and active. And what we saw is that the strength training actually caused the muscle to have a profile that was much more after the 10 weeks, of course, not pre, but post, it, the, the muscle was much more reminiscent of the, and it mirrored the molecular profile of the young, healthy, recreationally trained individuals. And what we looked at was the levels of NAD, NAD plus, we looked at NADH in the muscle cell, looked at an enzyme and a protein called NAMPT, which is one of the rate-limiting enzymes the body itself uses 
to make an AD plus from scratch, de novo. We also looked at the sirtuin levels, and those levels were also elevated after training. So before training, they were a lot lower, of course, in the middle-aged individuals. After training, it essentially more or less normalized or made them more youthful. And one of the things we did with NAD3 is we studied it in a muscle cell model first in vitro. Uh, We recently published that data uh, in the journal Nutrients, actually published last month. Um, And it basically showed that we were able to dramatically reduce something known as NLRP3 inflammasome, which is this big central hub that helps to drive inflammation chronic uh, and severe inflammation is usually going to be accompanied by high levels of NLRP3, inflammasome. So we were able to dramatically drop that, uh, and we saw increases in sirtuin levels, sirtuin-3, sirtuin-1, global sirtuin activity. So we mimicked with NAD3 the things that we saw in humans that happened with healthy resistance training over a 10-week period of time. And that's just one example of why we're excited about NAD3. Uh, We did about five preclinical studies first, and now we're in the middle of a big human trial with three different arms. Uh, We actually just finished the last subject a couple weeks ago, and so we're now analyzing all that data and getting ready to present it. Uh, And we're excited about what we're going to see in actual humans who took NAD3 every day for a 12-week period of time. We're looking at things like the epigenetic clock, reversing biological aging in humans. Uh, We're also looking to see what genes were turned on and off to see that it actually correlated with what we saw in the cells. And we're looking at various inflammatory markers as well as the individual's ability to control their glycemic um, response and insulin response as well to foods. Doctor, is this exercise in a bottle? Come on. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I would always, I'd always warn uh, my patients when I was practicing, right, that anyone who promises you that, it's, yeah, run, r- turn around and run fast and long, yeah. <laughs> uh, look, what we're trying to do here is just amplify the healthy behaviors that we already know work. And that's really what we set out to do. So we didn't want to replace, we don't want to replace healthy behaviors. We don't want to replace your calorie restriction, your healthy Mediterranean diets, your, your meditation, your social connections, all the things that we know work with the blue zones and the individuals that are super centenarians, um, the, the exercise obviously being one of them. We just want to uh, basically supplement and amplify all those behaviors and all those activities. Yeah, I think that's within. well said. I think, you know, one of my fundamental principles is these are supplements. They supplement your healthy behaviors. They are not a replacement for healthy uh, behaviors. And I should put an advisor for anybody who's listening. You know, whenever you're going to start a new regimen, whether it's a fitness regimen, whether it's an eating regimen, whether it's a supplement regimen, always check in with your physician or your health uh, person before you do that. Okay? Um, and I think you'd, you'd agree. Absolutely. hundred percent. All right. You know, this is, this is fascinating stuff. As you know, I am a fan of this product. So, uh, I, I guess I'm a fan because I like the research that went behind this. And, uh, I've been taking it actually for quite a while now and my wife takes it as well. So uh, this is, you know, you're at an exciting area. Are there any more exciting discoveries in longevity research that you're you're working on can you give us a teaser yeah so we're we're actually expanding the the preliminary work we've done because it's still early days and as you know all scientists will always say more work needs to be done right it's never over uh there's more derivative stuff coming Uh, what we're doing now is combining nad3 with other ingredients so we're looking at some you know, the synergy on top of synergy. What happens when you combine it, for example, with polyphenols that are found in olive oil or extra virgin high quality olive oil? We're looking at what happens when you combine it with rosemary extract or uh, things like coffee fruit or coffee berry extract. Uh, and we're finding some fascinating things in the, on the preclinical side. And now we're going to want to move that into the clinical realm. And one other thing I'll mention here, Dr. Gundry, is 
is that unlike many uh, ingredients that are touted for longevity on the market, this one has one other unique aspect to it, and that's that it's experiential and it's something you can feel. When you consume the product, NED3, for example, every morning with your coffee or your tea, it definitely will give you a little bit of a neurotropic lift. It'll give your mood or your affect a little bit of a lift, and you'll feel sharper. Uh, and we have that data. That's not just anecdotal data. We have that's borne itself out in more than uh, the, in the more than ten human clinical trials we've conducted on one of the cons- components, theocrine, uh, within it. So it's something that we know is working on a molecular level, and it's something you can feel, right? Which is sort of a bonus, and we're we're excited about that. No, that's great. And who wouldn't want to feel a little bit better in the current state of affairs? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All right, yeah, and actually all those compounds that you mentioned are, are high on my list of uh, additional compounds that, that I actually take and recommend. So uh, yeah, keep, uh, keep looking at those. I think you're absolutely on the right track. Um, all right. Well, sure Dr. Will. Lopez, this was a lot of fun. It's been great to have you on the show. Um, well, bring, likewise. It was, every it was great every talking now shot. and then we need some nice deep science so that people can hear, learn about all this. Uh, where can people find out more about you and your research and your companies? Uh, so uh, online, uh, supplementsafetysolutions.com uh, and uh, the C-A-H-S, uh, C-A-H-S.com. Uh, and then I, I also have a Twitter account, but I'm I, I usually don't, uh, I don't, I don't do much social media, so I don't, I don't do Instagram or Facebook. Uh, I'm getting a lot of pressure these days, though, uh, to, to, to get some more exposure out there and get some more of our work that we're doing out into the public domain. But uh, this, this, this is a wonderful way to do it, for sure. All right. Well, good. All right. Well, keep up the good work, and uh, I can't wait to hear of your latest discovery, and feel free to let me be a guinea pig uh, whenever you want me to be. Oh, we sure will. Thanks a lot for having me on. This is a lot of fun. Thank you. All right. Take care. All right. It's time for our audience question. This week it comes from Belle Shear on YouTube, who is asking for advice on following the Plant Paradox program without losing any weight. Uh, I'll answer quickly here, but for more information, check out the How to Eat More Calories the Healthy Way video on my Dr. Gundry podcast YouTube channel, because I go into that. So briefly, um, yes, weight loss is often a pleasant consequence of following our program, but we also have a number of people who actually are trying to gain weight. And one of the best ways that I've found through the years to get people to gain weight is to have them increase their consumption of macadamia nuts. And sometimes it takes a lot of macadamia nuts to do it. On the other hand, if um, high triglycerides and high insulin levels are not your problem, and quite frankly, most people with low weight, that's usually not a problem, feel free to use starches like there's now some fantastic pastas that are made out of cassava flour, sorghum flour, millet, and knock your socks off with using those. And you will, for the most part, gain weight using those products. And they're lectin-free. Same proviso, though. These are not free food uh, to have if you're trying to actually get weight off of you. So many times we see people inadvertently start to gain weight when they start eating lectin-free starches in in the mistaken thought that these are free and you can have as much as you want. But great question. But go to the YouTube channel and you'll see my answer. Time for the review of the week. Suzanne Elliott watched the episode where I explained my modified vegan fast. She said, very interesting podcast. I've been on the Dr. Gundry diet now for about 18 months and have lost 16 kilograms. That's uh, almost 35 pounds. I have to say that I am amazingly surprised by the changes in my body. I no longer have a ravenous appetite. After listening to your video last night, I thought I'd skip breakfast today and not snack. 
I can't believe I was able to do it. I'm so grateful for your program, Dr. Gundry. I watch all your videos. I've read all your books. I wish I'd known all your information 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, I'm 70, just like you. Thank you very much for your work. And thank you, Suzanne Elliott. It's, uh, it's your sort of writing in that keeps me doing what I'm doing. And uh, good for you. Keep doing it. And uh, try the modified vegan fast once a month. See what you think and write back in. All right, that's it for today. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. And I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.